Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. It's already been six weeks since AMD released their third gen Ryzen series. And yet despite that, only about a week ago now, I was able to get my hands on the Ryzen 7 3800X for the first time. The delay has been really, really annoying, mostly because every day I wake up to a few dozen comments from you guys asking me to review the 3800X. And I very much wanted to do that for the last six weeks, but yeah, as I said, was only just able to purchase one. And a big thank you to the guys at PC Case Gear for helping me out and get one in my hands, well, as fast as we've been able to. So you might be wondering, what's the deal? Why has the 3800X been so hard to get? How does it differ from the 3700X? And why has the TDP rating increased by over 60% for a 100 megahertz increase in boost frequency? Well, apparently the deal is binning and perhaps yields aren't as good as AMD hoped they would be, or the demand has just been far more extreme than AMD had anticipated, or maybe it's just a bit of both. Last week, Silicon Lottery released their Ryzen 3000 series bidding information, and their data does seem to suggest that there is a bidding process, and that the better quality silicon has been reserved for the 3800X. The top 20% of all 3800X processors that they tested passed their 4.3 GHz AVX2 stress test, whereas only the top 21% of all 3700X processors were stable at just 4.15 GHz. Meanwhile, all 3800X processors passed the test at 4.2 GHz, whereas all 3700X processors were only passable at 4.05 GHz. And this means the 3800X has about 150 megahertz more headroom when it comes to overclocking. So based on that, the 3800Xs should overclock better than the best 3700X processors. That said, we're only talking about a 6% difference in frequency between the absolute worst 3700X and the absolute best 3800X in their testing. For more casual overclockers like myself, the difference will likely be even smaller. My 3700X appears stable for our stress testing and to date hasn't crashed once at 4.3 GHz. And this is the same frequency limit for my retail 3800X. As for the TDP, well, that one's a bit confusing to say the least, but let's go over some performance numbers first and then I'll discuss what I think's going on here towards the end of the video. I'll also discuss pricing information towards the end of the video as well. For now, both CPUs have been tested on the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Extreme with 16 gigabytes of G-Skills Flarex DDR4-3200CL14 memory, and the graphics card of choice for CPU testing is of course the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. So let's get into the numbers. First up we have Cinebench R20 and hold on to your hats, we're looking at a 3% increase in multi-core performance with the 3800X, but hey, at least it's faster than the 9900K now. As for single core performance, well, we're looking at a 2% boost here, allowing the 3800X to match the 3900X and the 9900K. Here we see that encoding time in Premiere has been reduced by a mere 3%, shaving 12 seconds off our completion time. And given what we saw in Cinebench R20, this result isn't particularly surprising. We also see just a 3% reduction in render time when running the Blender Open Data benchmark. So not much more to say here really. Let's quickly check out a few game benchmarks before jumping into power consumption and thermals. Here we're really looking at margin of error type margins in Assassin's Creed Odyssey between the 3700X 3800X and the 3900X. Needless to say, they all deliver a very similar gaming experience in this title. Much the same as seen when testing with Battlefield 5, the 3800X is 1 to 2 FPS faster than the 3700X, thanks to a very small increase in operating frequency. But again, there's absolutely no way you'll notice this performance difference when actually playing the game. And once again, we see virtually identical performance, this time when testing with the Division 2. And it's fair to say we're looking at Core i7 8700K Lite performance with these new Ryzen processors. Then finally, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here the 3800X was 2 FPS faster than the 3700X, so let's move on to check out some power consumption numbers. Here we see a 9% increase in power consumption, which is surprising given that we're only talking about a 2-3% to increase in operating frequency. However, that frequency boost will see an increase in voltage, and this is likely why the 3800X is a little more power hungry than you might have expected. 
As a result of that increased power consumption, the 3800X runs three degrees hotter with the box cooler and four degrees hotter with the Corsair H115i Pro when compared to the 3700X. Interestingly though, with the box cooler, the 3800X clocked 100 megahertz higher, but just 70 megahertz higher with the Corsair all-in-one liquid cooler. Enabling PBO still saw the 3800X run around two to three degrees hotter, but now it's only clocking 25 to 50 megahertz higher than that of the 3700X. So if you want to turn your 3700X into a 3800X, just enable PBO. As for power consumption, we again see that the 3800X sucks down quite a bit more power than the 3700X. And that extra power draw, as we just saw, certainly isn't justified by the extra performance it offers. We saw up to a 3% performance improvement, and that's cost us around a 12% increase in power consumption. The margins remained much the same with PBO enabled. The 3800X still consumed around 12% more power than the 3700X. Okay, so that wasn't the most exciting benchmark session ever, but it did answer the question, what's the difference? As it turns out, not a lot. During heavy workloads, the 3800X clocks between 100 to 150 megahertz higher, which amounts to a two and a half to four percent frequency increase. This did increase power consumption of the CPU by around 12 percent, which meant it ran a few degrees hotter and that potentially makes it a bit louder. For this minor performance increase, AMD's jacked up the MSRP by 21 percent, taking the retail price from $330 to $400 US. So the biggest percentage increase here, if we ignore the TDP, comes from the price. So I think that's probably all you really need to know. You'll get 3% more performance at best by spending 21% more of your money. If you're interested in that deal, I have a heap of old, but still really good Xeon systems I purchased for some videos that you can have at a really good price. Let's quickly talk about the 105 watt TDP, which has been increased by 62% over the 65 watt TDP rating of the 3700X. It seems AMD is basically saying this, with a cooler rated to dissipate 65 watts of heat, the 3700X will run no lower than its base clock. The 3800X, which has clocked 300 megahertz higher for the base, may not be able to maintain 3.9 gigahertz with a 65 watt cooler. The confusion creeps in though when AMD skips their 95 watt rating, which they clearly have, for a 105 watt rating for the 3800X. We accept that the 3800X might not be able to sustain 3.9 gigahertz with a 65 watt cooler, but surely it can with a 95 watt cooler. Anyway, as far as I can tell, the TDP is really a metric for OEMs who typically try to cut as many corners as possible. For example, if an OEM was to put a 65 watt cooler on a 95 watt part and the buyer says, hey, I'm not hitting 3.9 gigahertz, then AMD can reply with, well, the OEM isn't meeting our base spec for the cooler. At the end of the day, I don't really get why the TDP is something they advertise at all. It clearly creates a lot of confusion. You just have to look at our comment sections. And it really should be something that you find on an OEM spec sheet just for engineers. In my opinion, AMD might be better off just advertising the rating of the cooler they provide with each processor, informing customers what kind of cooling performance they'll need if they want to upgrade. For example, if the Wraith Prism is a 105 watt cooler, you'll want something rated above that if you wish to upgrade, 150 watts for example. And just as a side note, I don't want to just throw AMD under the bus on this one. I feel like Intel's even worse here. Their TDP ratings are even more misleading, more useless. Certainly useless for you guys who buy a K-series processor like the 9900K and it's got a 95 watt rating. So will a, will a 100 watt cooler give you plenty of headroom? It certainly won't. So I don't know why they aren't telling users they need a 200 watt cooler for the 9900K. Anyway, I could go on and on about this, but I won't. So I think we'll wrap this one up here. In a nutshell, I highly recommend avoiding the 3800X. Not that it's a bad processor, you're just better off saving the money and grabbing yourself the 3700X as it's essentially the same thing. And then if you find it necessary, upgrade the box cooler to something that's a bit quieter with the money that you saved. And that's gonna do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate the work we do at Hiram Box, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.